Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome to another episode of The Show Radio. This is episode 657. I am your host, Andrew. And with me today, guest hosting is Aaron Shack from Aaron Shack TV. Aaron, what's up, man? What's going on? Yo, what's up, man? Thank you for having me here. I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, of course, man. We're going to hang out. We're going to talk about games. A lot of stuff to talk about. We know there's an announcement coming up very, very soon. I believe that's Thursday this week for Xbox. If they're going to become a third party or not, what that conversation entails, we'll see towards the end of the week. But we have a lot of stuff to talk about, about Hideo 2. We're going to touch on that. Helldivers, I know you have some thoughts there. And and since since you're the guest, I think I'm going to move that at the very top because you've been checking out Helldivers 2. It is a big, the biggest launch from what I understand, you know, for PlayStation on Steam. So what do you think about Helldivers? And I'll ask you some questions, man. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Uh, they already have over 150,000 concurrent players, at least on Steam. And then they said that there's even that much over on the PlayStation. And um, it, it's just pure fun is, is what the game is. It's very simple. You're, you got your Helldiver guy. You arm him up with his armor, his weapons. He gets in the drop pod like a little ODST from Halo. And you drop down, you land on whatever moon you've selected, and you're either fighting the the bugs, you know, like Starship Troopers, or it's uh, the Automatons, which are basically like Terminator robots. And so there is a live service element to the game, but before people get scared about that, it's actually kind of a good thing. You have Earth in the middle of the map, and then you have the rest of the galaxy surrounding it. And the bugs are coming in from this side, and the robots are coming from this side. And they've said that they're going to add other races too throughout the galaxy. So there'll be other enemies to fight. But That's so dope. far, there's that. That's and dope. they're taking over each planet, each moon is, is being contested. So that's the live service element is that if we don't keep fighting, the bugs will take over this planet and they'll get ah, closer okay. to Earth. Okay. Yeah. And so when we do take over a planet, then that means that one's ours and we move on to the next, you know, contested part of the system. So there's also a um, how many planets sort of, are you dealing with? How many moons and stuff like what are you dealing with? Do there's you, do know? clearly a lot, but I mean, there's only like maybe four that are open right now that are contested. So two on each side, I think. Um, and so there's also a procedurally generated maps. So when you do land on each location, it's a little bit different every time. You don't know what the battlefield's exactly going to look like where there's going to be bunkers or shelters or missile launch sites because you can launch missiles. You can arm artillery rifles uh, with nuclear missiles. You can put those in and call in extra airstrikes as, as a result there. Um, and it's got a lot of friendly fire, but that is a, a selling point is the hilarity of accidentally shooting your friends or dropping a massive bomb on the bugs. And it also wipes out one of your buddies. Um, communication is definitely something that needs to be made clear during stuff like that. Um, the weapons are powerful. There's a co-op element to even the weapons. Uh, if I get the rocket launcher, my buddy can pick up the backpack, which has the rockets and he can stay in next to me and load them in for me, which is quicker than me having to stop and reload and put the rocket in. So there's lots of interesting co-op elements there. And depending on what you bring and what airstrikes you equip on your character. And then also to even call in the airstrikes or to reinforce your buddy. If he dies, you have to call in a pod to drop. Uh, there's a, a directional input from the D-pad. You have to like put in a little button combination. So it'll be like left, left, down, right, up, left. And then, <laughs> which I did not expect from right. a game. <laughs> Right, from a right. game like that but it introduces like some randomness and some chaos and like hang on man i'm typing in the coordinates you know like it's coming in so i mean it's just pure fun it's a yeah, really so fun game you just shoot bugs do you think it's do you think it's a hit because it's something that we've been missing or do you think it's why do you think it's a hit like based on like if you were to pull back like why do you yeah. think it's it's a hit looking at macro it's like Really, the only other games that do stuff like this is like Left 4 Dead, Gears of War, Halo's firefight mode. We get these once in a blue moon. And and honestly, I feel like that type of mode has been like a dying genre. Everything has moved to battle royales or more strict multiplayer game. Co-op stuff is really 
part of live service models and games like Destiny or Division, but we don't really get this like really fun replayable experience that's just made to be fun. It's very very simple concept. It's not the most gorgeous game, although it is gorgeous. Um, it's got simple concepts, simple weapons, you know, several different enemies, but there's a lot of different weapons that you can utilize and unlock. And then of course you have the battle pass, which unlocks even more weapons as you play the game, more armor to customize your character. And then armor has perks. Uh, there's also some armor that you can purchase with real world money. Um, but that's pretty common to have microtransactions, microtransactions like in games, of course, to keep the live service afloat. Um, but the battle pass, all of that is earned in game. So you, you cannot cheat your way through that. Even though it's a co-op game, you can, you have to play, you have to unlock the medals by completing missions and objectives. And then you get to spend those medals. However you choose. Pretty cool. No, I dig it. I dig it. So so if you were to rate it based on your impressions, of what you played so far, what would you give it like a letter or a number? What would you give it? Yeah, I would I would say I highly recommend it. So, I mean, it's it's got to be up in that eight to ten range. Yeah, that's dope. That's that's surprising. That's surprising. Uh, but it's not surprising <laughs> for PlayStation, right? Because they've been, you know, planning this for quite some time. But, you know, the reception of, of the title, I think, is is really dope. All right. So so good stuff for mm-hmm. Helldivers 2. Uh, definitely check it out if you haven't done so already. Uh, next thing that we have is uh, Project Orion, CD Project Red. What what is that? What does that mean? The next step for CD Project Red? Do you think this game uh, should be a multiplayer? I think that they should add that element uh, in the games because it is something that we all enjoy. You know, if it's a PvP slash E uh, environment, I think that'd be great as well. We've seen that in Division. You know, especially when you're heading into that, the dark zone stuff. So so what do you think? Uh, next thing for for Seed Project Red, Project Orion, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think um, part of their original plan with 2077 was that there was going to be some sort of multiplayer mode at some point. And so I was just curious how that would fit into the game, you know, with it being kind of an RPG first and, a, you know, a shooter Grand Theft Auto style game second. You know, how do you make that fair across the board? How do you make it interesting and exciting? So I think they have a really fun challenge ahead of themselves. And I figure it would be a lot like GTA where there is sort of it's got to be is this guy going to be my friend. Is he not going to be my friend? It's got to be. It's got to be for sure. (laughs) Yeah. And so hopefully, you know, we get some gang wars or, or something going on with that cops and robbers, you know. I'm I'm sure they can create all sorts of fun elements, but yeah, being able to share that city and that experience and your character that you create with your friends, that's a win all around if they can pull it off. Yeah. I'm actually looking forward to it. I think even with the last expansion, you know, what became, you know, there, the monumental thing that shifted the conversation for CD project red, I think they did an amazing job with that and going, if, if that wasn't successful, we wouldn't be having a conversation about, you know, Project Orion or what would be next for CD Project Red. So the fact that that did extremely well, here we are. And I think it should be good, man. I think everything that we look at now with multiplayer, I do enjoy. Right. But most of the stuff that I play, you know, is either multiplayer standard or looter shooter multiplayer. Right. And even in those experiences, there's a lot to enjoy because they're still competition the 1v1 competition the team com- you know competition that's still something that drives me to play these type of games so if they do something extremely fun you know hopefully you know things will be inspired from like time splitters i know we kind of lost that we don't even know yeah. if we're ever going to get that back right so worlds like that that inspired us to play multiplayer things even the character and remembering who the characters were and the titles i think that's that's going to be something that we're going to need to see and upcoming multiplayer games and titles in the future. So whether it's CD Projekt Red that does that or, you know, new characters for the hero shooters or new characters for the looter shooters, I think it's going to be interesting to see even the new division stuff that, you know, we're going to check out, you know, fairly soon within the next couple of weeks because of of the revision and going back to basics. A lot of these games are going back to basics. And I think we, we love to see that and it's going to allow us to jump back in and have a lot of fun. So, so yeah, so Project Orion, We'll wait and see. We're on the wait and see timeline right now. Right. Yeah. And and it should be it should be good. It should be fun. So uh, so here we have some news for Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the TV series. Uh, Paramount Plus unveiled the first look of the Tales 
of the Ninja Turtles. Some people like the way they look. Some people do not. Uh, where do you fare with that? Where do you stand? I'm in the middle, man, because I I always enjoyed the classic 80s TV show and I always kind of want it to go back that way. But I have to understand that, you know, things change. Art styles adapt over time. Um, media is not always made with adults in mind. They're probably thinking more about what do the next generation of kids want? What are they growing up looking at? What do they listen to? What are the behaviors of the turtles? They're not they're not the same as they were when we were kids. Things were different. You know, we were saying words like Calabunga and Radical Dude and all these all this 80s slang that, you know, has kind of shifted. So yeah. as each movie comes out, each TV show, video game, the turtles are going to change. But inherently, they're still the same characters. It's still the same lovable concept and the same enemies. So at the end of the day, I think I'm still going to be watching, man. What about you? Yeah. So I think for me, they're still going to be the Ninja Turtles, but there are certain parts of the culture that they're, we're going to see during that current creation or current adaptation of the Turtles. So, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, dances or TikToks or uh, different technologies, of course, Donatello and the Turtles are going to right. You know what I'm saying? They're going yeah. to like, yeah, take they're going to be in. awesome, man. They're yeah. going to be they're going to take that in and even do some dances, you know, that came from from TikTok. You know what I mean? So I yeah, think they some, are. They are some some individuals when they're thinking about it, it's like, oh, you know, I just want the same, you know, Turtles that I had when I, I don't know if we're always going to, to get the same thing. Even with Sonic, we've uh-huh. gotten some some different Sonic, you know, characters. Mm-hmm throughout the year. So I think it's, it's fun to see the changes and the adaptation of culture. My thing is, you know, whatever you're doing, just keep the same, um, super, uh, their, the, their ability to fight is always going to be there. We know they're amazing ninjas, you know, keep that. Mm -hmm. They love pizza. Keep that right. There's just certain things that you're not going to remove, you know, from, from the franchise itself. Like when they're solo, uh, they could be defeated when they're together. Nobody can defeat them. It could be aliens from outer space. It doesn't matter. You know, you're going to keep those things. But culturally, they're going to adapt to the things that's happening uh, in real time. So I don't have an issue with it. Mm-hmm. And even some people have issues with, you know, what happened with Master Chief and, you know, being able to, you know, not have his emotions suppressed anymore because of of the pill removal and all that stuff. And I think people are like, ah, oh, I don't know if I wanted to see that. But there are just certain <laughs> things that's going to adapt for you know, our attention, especially our attention on screen. And th- and that time, you know, has actually diminished because of the TikToks and the shorts and all the things that we watch now, you know, so getting our attention and keeping our attention on screen is going to be uh, a challenge, you know, for a lot of companies and some companies do it well and, and some are still working on it. So I'm here for it. I think there's a lot going on with the turtles that you can enjoy. Absolutely, man. Yeah, so so that's what's going on with the Turtles. The uh, next thing that we have is new data suggests that PS5 has outsold Xbox Series X and S 2 to 1. Uh, what do you think about that? I think that's very plausible. I think PlayStation had a very strong launch with a lot of games that were unique, right? Returnal, Demon Souls, Miles Morales was on PS4 and PS5 at the time. So people were looking to take advantage of the new hardware. You got the new controller, which is clearly a next generation step up with the dual sense, the haptic um, haptic vibrations uh, technology. You have the triggers. Um, it, it definitely adds next level immersion to your gaming. Um, whereas Xbox, we were waiting on Halo Infinite. We were waiting on next gen versions of games to come. We still don't have a new Gears of War in this era. Um, So really, we were buying the Series X and S on the promise of like, hey, the future with Xbox is bright. We've acquired all these studios. We have all these games in the works. We've shown you teases of Perfect Dark, Avowed. Now now we've seen Indiana Jones and stuff like that. So they definitely came out stronger out of the gate. And PlayStation has Spider-Man. They've got God of War. They have these quality exclusives that bring you in. Um, whereas Xbox spreads the field a little more with Game Pass and with launching their games on PC day of that allows more gamers to be able to jump in and play. And there's really no reason to buy an Xbox if you have a gaming PC or something like that. So that affects their console sales as well, because their community is more than just the box, whereas PlayStation, it's all about the box. Everything yeah. is motivated 
to sell their box. Yeah. Yeah, I, I dig it. I, I think with with everything PlayStation has done, you have to appreciate it. Uh, over mm-hmm. the years, we've seen some incredible games, you know, for that system. Right. I think the other thing, too, to consider is that, you know, who's looking at the data now um, as much as like I, I know we used to focus on, hey, because this number is so high for this particular console, you know, they're winning the race in the console war. I know we're going to talk about that later a little bit. But who's really looking at that stuff? I think at this stage, you know, for me, when you think about what Xbox has done to be everywhere, the everywhere strategy, right? Uh, especially mm-hmm. with the Game Pass and all the subscriptions. And there's streaming platforms and subscriptions pretty much everywhere now, right? It's not just exclusive to the gaming uh, industry. I think that, you know, that having the users that are still subscribed is a bigger deal, especially if you're not really focusing on console sales anymore. I don't think that Xbox is focusing on console sales as much. I know they've, they've mentioned that they're still going to make consoles. Uh, it's just like a bridge or an extension of the things that they're doing at, at that point. It's not, it doesn't even feel like a primary focus anymore. Right. Because when you think about how things are being done now, and you know, I definitely want to hear your take on this. It's like, it's really pushing what the Xbox, the, the game pass has to offer. Right whether that's a day one situation or not a day one situation, Hey, you can play that game right now. You know, if you're, if you have Xbox game pass, it's not, Hey, get the console and play the game. And I think even that conversation has changed over the years to make us believe not everyone though, to make us believe that we actually own the games that we're subscribed to on game pass, which is, you know, could be a little shady marketing depending on who says that. Right. So I think that's the conversation, you know, but yeah, but go ahead. What, what's, what's your take on that? And that is 100% on point. I mean, you can buy a Samsung TV with the Xbox app built in. You can access Project X Cloud on your phone and play games through the cloud in your phone or web browser. So, I mean, the need for the box is like pretty much gone. And even if you buy a disc, what is a disc nowadays? It's just a verification token that you have to put in to prove that you own the game. The game is not on the disc. You prove that you own the game. Xbox Live fires up. It downloads the data from the internet, which means you always need internet now to be able to download the game and to be able to play it. Sometimes it even has to check in with the internet to keep playing the game. So you you must remain online for certain games, which we could argue about all that stuff all day. Um, but yeah, I think that shows that their plan is not motivated on console sales. They said... I, I think they've pretty much admitted that they can't they can't beat PlayStation on exclusives and on just making incredible experiences like they have. I think they will at some point. They will really get things together with all the studios that they've done, but that's playing the long game. Right now they can create this sense of Xbox as a community rather than the box and the loyalty to the console and all that. It's more about, wow, I got Game Pass and with Game Pass, I can play anything I want, anytime, anywhere, any place, whether my Xbox is here in the living room or I'm on my PC and in the game room, or if I got my phone and I'm on a flight or I got my Steam Deck or whatever it is you're using as your peripherals. And that's only going to expand more and more uh, as things go along. So I think Xbox just wants to be so prevalent and everywhere that you can't ignore them. And that is a pretty powerful um, competition, I would say. And competition breeds innovation. So I think it's good all around. Everybody's competing in different spaces and it's a good thing. Absolutely. And we're going to see more of that with the announcement that they have on Thursday. Okay, so Sega blames poor financial quarter on weak sales uh, of recent games. Uh, So I think that's probably going to be considered a quick hit. Any thoughts on that? What are Sega's recent games, would you say? Besides, you know, Sonic and and some of the Yakuza stuff. Yeah, and then they dropped the Yakuza stuff. Yeah, I mean, I think the Yakuza thing is a little bit of a niche market with the with kind of the turn based stuff going on with the Infinite Wealth game. Um, And Superstars came out on the heels of Super Mario Brothers Wonder, which is arguably one of the best side scroller games we've had in years. I mean, they innovated the gameplay to a whole new level. So while I'm still interested in Sonic Superstars, it took second place for me. It took the silver medal. So, I mean, I I can't be too mad about that. And it's a bummer that Sega's in that position right there. But 
I mean, it makes sense. It makes sense that they're blaming poor sales because, I mean, they they really dropped that one at a bad time, I would say. Yeah, timing is always important. We've seen that with a lot of games in the past. Don't put anything around Call of Duty. OK, you're not going to do well. No. Right? Just just <laughs> don't ever do that. OK, so it's a it's a suicide, literally. OK, yeah. so so speaking of that, right. Suicide yeah. Squad. What do you think about that? What's going on? Oh, there? My- <laughs> <laughs> he really went in on the, yeah, on did, the suicide. Did. OK, um, yeah, it, this this is quite a game, man. I, I didn't know what to think of it coming out the gate um myself and my channel were were big on comic books and comic book video games and stuff like that so um i was very excited to see that dc has a new game coming out and that it's rock steady you know the company that built the batman arkham games that that finally made batman a viable video game character you know what are they going to do next what have they been working on for the past nine years and it's been Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League. And I think it's a very contentious game online right now uh, in discussions because, you know, the very premise of the game is kill the Justice League. It's our heroes. It's Batman. It's Superman. It's Wonder Woman. It's Green Lantern. The Flash. These are our heroes that we've grown up and idolized. And this game is now asking us to do the unthinkable. So, I mean, a lot of people just don't like it on that premise. Um, and I can see it. It's very hard to to pull the trigger on on your heroes. But um, it's got really good storytelling. It's got that rock steady DNA in its narrative, its dialogue, the characters, the animations, the combat. Everything has been engineered in that rock steady way. I think the only thing that's different and new is the looter shooter aspect where you're collecting loot. That's giving you certain types of perks, different weaponry, um, different traversal skills, grenades, mods that you're applying. And then, of course, you have various weapon merchants that are selling you uh, the ability to craft and customize your gear, which I mean, that's stuff that even Destiny and Division didn't have until late in their life cycle. So Rocksteady finally did the thing that that we always say every time a new looter shooter is coming into space when anthem was coming in we're like oh are they gonna learn from division and destiny and not follow in their footsteps and make the exact same mistakes well they did and then they made some new ones and the avengers came into space and they you know are they gonna innovate are they gonna not make the same mistakes they made the same mistakes they made some new mistakes right and so with suicide squad it really feels like they looked at the big picture of like okay this is clearly what avengers did wrong you know we gotta have the end game out the gate we gotta have infamy levels that people can grind. There has to be something sustainable. And then they've already promised multiple seasons post game. The Joker is going to be one of them. I've got theories about the other three characters. I think probably Mr. Freeze and Deathstroke are going to be two of them joining the squad as playable characters, new areas that will be unlockable there. Um, the combat is very different. It's not your typical rock steady beat em up. And I do feel that there's a bit of a learning curve to it. I think you have to you have to play as the characters and level them up and get used to how they traverse because the game is all about going vertical. It's all about verticality. Um, Don't say that. Don't say that (laughs) word. Oh, my gosh. You are doing so good. I got him, dude. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) <laughs> you're doing so they good the we're, we're, with a lot we're of gonna leave we're gonna leave it in okay of... we're gonna leave it in oh my gosh <laughs> okay go ahead go ahead so they designed the maps with a lot of um a lot of, there's a lot of length in these maps. okay okay um, okay so you have to you have to definitely find a way to get your character from point a to point b um and as quick as possible so harley quinn has the bat drone and the grapple so she can pretty much swing around like spider-man uh, King Shark is, uh, you know, he has superhuman abilities that allows him to jump really high and far like the Hulk. Um, Deadshot's got the jet pack that he can utilize. And then Captain Boomerang has the speed gauntlet, which almost turns him into the Flash. Um, Who's your favorite character? Access to speed force. Um, I think the the character I built the best and I've spent the most time on and enjoyed was Deadshot. I think sniping for critical hits, flying around with the jetpack and hovering around using the wrist cannons, 
and being able to stack up lots and lots of kills and deal massive damage has been my favorite. But honestly, as I've spread myself out and started playing as each character, I see that each one is unique and fun to play as. And now that question gets a little more difficult the more I play. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> that makes sense. That makes sense. Suicide Squad. Okay, uh, Batman making an appearance or no? Batman is there, and it's Kevin Conroy, and he is knocking it out of the park. I mean, regardless of what we think of the story and the characters, like the man is giving it his all. And I think the devs even talked about that to a point um, where there were some Twitter posts of people saying, oh, this is Kevin Conroy's last role. You know, this is a dishonor to him and his legacy. And the developers at Rocksteady came out and said, actually, we talk to Kevin every day. He loved this project. He loved the chance to be able to play a different version of the character, to be an evil Batman, something he's never done before. Um, he was excited about doing that. So if it's got his stamp of approval, I owe it to myself to at least give it a chance and play through it. That's good. That's good, man. No, that's beautiful. I dig it. So uh, a couple of things. Uh, we're we're going to talk about some some heavy topics. Yeah, I know we've been thinking about this uh, for uh, a few minutes at this point. Okay, so first thing we have here is Xbox is still committed to making consoles. We kind of touched on that uh, briefly. We don't think that's going away. So I think we both agree there, right? Mm -hmm. So we're not going to focus too much time there. Uh, but uh, what I do want to spend time on a little bit is uh, Microsoft. Are they becoming a third party? What does that mean? There's a big announcement happening this Thursday. That's the 15th of February. And they're going to give you know some additional information. I believe that's going to be on the Xbox uh, podcast. You sent me that news. You know, thank you for sending that over. I do appreciate that. Uh, so, so what do you think is going to happen? And we could talk about console wars a little bit. You know how I feel about that. Uh, but what do you think is going to oh, happen man. on Thursday if you had to uh, give some predictions? I don't think it's going to be uh, something that's going to be negative, of course, yeah. for Xbox. But I think it's, it should be a positive thing for the industry. That's that's my hope. Well, go ahead. I think it's a plus, but I, the fact that it's going to be Bill Spencer. Matt Booty and Sarah Bond, the, the fact that they're bringing in the big people at the top to talk about this, this is going to be serious. So, you know, even though we don't want to substantiate on rumors and stuff, uh, you speculate a I, little I bit. just think they're yeah, I just think that they're going to be really serious about what the future is and give us a, a roadmap moving forward and what we can expect, because I feel like every time we hear a rumor or anyone says anything, all of a sudden the internet runs crazy with it. And we're like, oh my God, Master Chief's going to be on PlayStation and Starfield's going to the Switch and Hi-Fi Rush is gone and Sea of Thieves. And now we don't have any exclusives. So now I got to take a chainsaw to my Xbox. You know, people going really wild. <laughs> right, people, go, right, right. people going wild, man. Right, right, keep so, going, keep going. All right, go ahead. Yeah, they're. <laughs> People are crazy, man. Right, uh, right. But ultimately, uh, to the consumer, like, what does that change about most of us? I mean, some of us might own a PC or a Switch or a PlayStation. And if you don't, that's the difficult part, is that a lot of people hinge all their bets at looking at, okay, I can only buy one console this generation. Me and the family, we're on a limited budget. Got wife, I got kids, or whatever it may be. Um, you know, and they look at what exclusives are available and they say, oh, I got if if I go Xbox, I can play Master Chief. I got Gears of War. I got Forza. I got whatever they promised in the future, which looks exciting. But if I go Sony, then I get Spider-Man and Horizon and, you know, incredible narrative third person action games that they guarantee. But if everything's kind of blurred, then and, and Master Chief is over there, then it's like, oh, well, why do I need to buy an Xbox? So that could really hurt the Xbox brand in a way that could backfire. Um, so while I say I don't care if exclusives go here or there or anywhere, um, I guess it has to be really specific about how they're going to do that moving forward. Are there going to be 12 month, you know, waiting periods before things move out? Um, are they going to decide that some Bethesda titles like Elder Scrolls or Starfield are, are potentially better sold everywhere? Or like Call of Duty, it's it's historically multi-platform. It's probably best that it is sold everywhere and, and not just exclusive on one console. So 
if Xbox truly is anti exclusivity and you know prefers to be omnipresent, <laughs> then um, I think that's probably the direction they're going. But maybe it's not as dramatic as everybody on the internet thought. Maybe there's no reason to panic, right? Let's say it is that dramatic, right? Let, let's okay. go crazy with it. Let's say we start seeing Halo on platforms that we didn't think we'd ever see Halo on. Is that a bad deal? No, I is think Halo not- is a lot of fun, dude. And the more players, the more fun it is, right? Right. So Hi-Fi Rush, Halo, Starfield, Gears of War, you know, some of these mm-hmm. titles. If the intent is to be everywhere, wh- what does that exclude? It doesn't exclude anyone right yeah. if you have a relationship and that's what's interesting about this is like this console war stuff and and i definitely say if you have some time please watch that documentary it will change your whole perspective um no well it, it won't change your whole perspective let, let me just you know uh, amend that real quick you know uh, mm-hmm. append well, one of those words right <laughs> it will change and it, it will make some adjustments to how you see the console wars and how we've dealt with that conversation as content creators and gamers throughout the years. Right. Mm-hmm. It's fascinating. You have to watch it. It is on I YouTube. Wait, dude. I'll, I'll link you. You know, I, I want to hear your, your immediate thoughts as soon as you're, you're done watching it. So, so yeah. uh, just a quick tease uh, for that particular documentary uh, console wars. Uh, there is a conversation that's happening in, in that battle for, of course, Nintendo versus Sega, but even Sega versus Sega. And how the things that we see today by way of Sega as a software company and not as a hardware company anymore, you can see the writing on the wall when you watch the documentary and it all will make sense once you watch that. Console Wars, definitely check it out. They didn't pay me to say that, but maybe they should. (laughs) But but it was really good. It's really good. Okay, so so what if they go crazy? Hi-Fi Rush, Gears of War, um, all the games that we enjoy on certain platforms. And the other part I was going to make uh, by way of a note is that these individuals are friends. They have friendships among these companies, whether it's a Nintendo, you know, to a PlayStation, to a Xbox, to to, to a Microsoft. They have relationships. They can, grad- can congratulate each other when they come out with new products and, and new ventures and things of that nature. Yes, they're in competition because they're businesses. Mm-hmm. They, they are still friendships in those companies. And hopefully they're genuine. They're not going to do what happened with Sega when we lost the Dreamcast, right? That that world really shifted because they lost a top tier marketing uh, executive during that time. Fascinating documentary. Again, definitely watch it. <laughs> you, you, you'll be happy that you did. OK, so yeah. let's go crazy. We get all the games. We get them on Nintendo. We get them on, on PlayStation. What does that mean? That means everyone who has those platforms they, they pay for the hardware. Now they're able to enjoy those games, not only on the streaming side of things, but they can actually enjoy that on the system itself. Right. Not just streaming only. Like if they download digitally that title, Hi-Fi Rush is on that particular platform. Now, what, what is wrong with that? You know, someone's getting a cut. Someone is benefiting. Right. Mm-hmm. Both companies would be benefiting if they decide to do that. I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. If they go more third party and they localize more games from across the the pond, if you want to call it that, is that a bad thing? I don't think it's a I don't think it's a bad thing. I think they went as a company because we've been waiting for titles, you know, for such a long time. Like even when you look at Persona 3, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Look what's going on with that. Like that thing is is just flying off the shelves, quote unquote. Right. And it's an old game, right? Like it's it's not a, they're on five right now. Like five is the most recent one. Oh my gosh. And we're excited that we're getting three on Xbox because it's never been there before. That's access to a Japanese market that has never been on Xbox. And that's something that needs to happen. That's been dominated by Sony for ages, the Asian market. So I don't necessarily see that, you know, as, as a bad thing. But oh, it's a win. I don't know. Maybe All we'll around. have that conversation on Thursday. Maybe if we can make some time, maybe we'll go crazy yeah. with it. We'll see. I'm we'll keen. see. But I don't think that it's it's necessarily a bad thing uh, if they decide to go to more of the third party route while still doing a lot of things in house. I don't think that's a bad deal. I don't think that's a bad. Does deal. that mean? Does that mean that Xbox is in trouble? Is that why they're making this move? They just spent all this money on Bethesda and Active Activision. Now they're they're leaking funds because they're not selling enough Xboxes and not enough games are being sold, and everyone's going to Sony and Nintendo. 
Yeah, I, I don't see it. I don't see it as as a bad thing. I think yeah. if it's one of those things where if you look at history and you want to not repeat a lot of things that took place that were bad, you mm-hmm. have to be the first individuals or the first group to change the trajectory of what's been for so many mm-hmm. years, right? We've been mm-hmm. fighting over which console is the best for the last, however, you know, since the 80s, right? Yeah. From, from Nintendo to Sega to, you know, Sony's uh, PlayStation to uh, Sega Saturn to Nintendo 64 uh, to Jaguar to, uh, to PlayStation 2 to Xbox to, uh, to Xbox 360. Yeah. Like we've been fighting for such a long time, but for what? Like we just want the games to enjoy. And as content creators and entrepreneurs, we want to make sure that we can use those tools and software and even collaborations and partnerships to benefit us in a process. So we all can win if all Mm -hmm. these games come out on every single platform that we can use them for. So I don't see it as a bad thing. So I'm going in, you know, somewhat blind, right? We're, we're, you know, we're speculating, we're just, you know, jabbing here and there, you know, and this conversation, but like, I don't, I don't care, you know, about, you know, how the conversation is going to go. I'm just glad that the conversation is taking place, right? Because we're at a place now with, with the technology that we have that all the games can pretty much be everywhere if the, the hardware can handle it, like literally, right? So we have Nintendo Switch 2 maybe uh, on, you know, rumors or you know, I don't know if it's speculation or rumors or anything at this point, but if the hardware can handle it, I mean, Hi-Fi Rush is not a tough game to handle. Right. I mean, maybe Halo, of course, Gears. Halo yes, could be right? tough, Gears, yeah. You know, but outside of that, I mean, what are we, are we complaining about anything here? I think this is good. Yeah. I think this is good. So yeah, that's where we stand there, okay? Hideo Tube, let's go there. Hideo Tube, uh, after being a hiatus, I believe, for about seven years, we got a special edition of Hideo Tube, you know, talking about the recent announcements of uh, not just OD, not just, you know, making uh, Death Stranding the first one and talking about Death Training 2 and even talking about why he's making Fizzent. That's what I'm going with. OK. Mm-hmm. Or the next Metal Gear. OK. So so let's talk about that a little bit. You know, we've seen, you know, some things uh, surrounding that. I do have some notes that I want to mention, you know, on record uh, that Hideo mentioned about why he's creating the next Metal Gear, you know, Fizzent, you know, a code word there, a keyword uh, for, for it right now. and how he had to reconsider his priorities. So I want to hear your thoughts there and then I'll fill in some, some things after. Yeah. I think Kojima, you know, after branching off from Konami and being able to kind of do whatever he wants and, and make the games and the passion and the media that he's wanted to do and film or or create this team, you know, this incredible team that's made incredible games over the past several years and have been teasing all these projects that are on the way. You know, he's got the collaboration with uh, Peel, Jordan Peel. Um, he's got that uh, horror, or not a horror, it's a collaboration with A24. Um, he's doing like a Death Stranding thing. And now he's got Fizzent, and we've got Death Stranding 2 on the way. Um it's all stuff to be really excited about. And I've been waiting a long time to get more of Hideo too, because he really is one of those once in a generation, um, it, not even just a console generation, but like a generation of humanity. He's one of those genius filmmakers. He's a Scorsese. He's a Tarantino. You know, he is that to the game industry. And he has been such a presence since even before he dropped Metal Gear Solid 1, but I think we really consider that game as a certain point in the industry where we were like, okay, games can be art. This is like watching a movie. This is this has voice acting. This makes me care about the characters. It has camera angles. And the more you play, you know, you see what he did in Metal Gear Solid 5 with the camera angles and the chasing cam and all that. And doing the same with Death Stranding. I mean, it's like living a movie. And then he turned what people would say is a walking simulator, but it's more a simulation of actually walking. You're working on your balance, your stamina, you're carrying all this gear and trying not to tilt one way or the other. It really immerses you in hiking and path choosing 
which we really get into the stuff about why game developers make ladders yellow and why the ledges we have to climb are covered in yellow paint and the barrels we have to destroy are red. Well, I mean, with Kojima, it's like everything was open. It was a canvas and you could climb anything you wanted to climb within reason. Otherwise, you had to get tools out. So I think it's exciting. And I think he has a very limited time on this earth and he's getting older and he's not that old. But I think he realizes exactly how long it takes for a Death Stranding type of project to be done and how much it takes for a new project. And that's why uh, he was talking with Guillermo del Toro, who told he said, I want to get in the movie industry. I want to do this and that. And he said, no, stick with the game. Stick with what you're good at. You can do more in with the tools that you have in a shorter time. You come over here and do a movie. You're going to lose six to ten years of your life. So, I mean, they had a really honest conversation as two filmmakers together. And I think the fact that he gets that level of respect in the industry from actors and filmmakers and people that understand his his path in this world, that's incredible. It is absolutely incredible. And one of the things that really caught me with uh, this particular Hideo tube is that Mm -hmm. I I don't necessarily love subtitled things, but, you know, if I really want to know what's happening in that particular world or movie, then you have to watch it. Right. Especially if it's in another language. Uh, he's 60 last year, you know, 61 this year, about 10 years away from being 70. You know, that was a note that was mentioned. Uh, the the thing mm-hmm. that I want to before I get my thoughts on, on this um, Fizzent and X Metal Gear and all that stuff is um, f- uh, feedback from gamers. Right. When companies take the time to listen to the gamers that are playing their games hours upon hours, the gamers that find the hidden walls, you know, the cracks, you know, in the games, you know, the glitches and all that stuff. When you uh, that understand storytelling, because we have storytellers and people who understand storytelling that are gamers, you know, that Mm -hmm. are moms, dads and, you know, who love games and who who understand, you know, writing and how to to write creatively and, and things like that. So when you create a world that has a lasting impact on gamers, Metal Gear, you know, one through five and everything that we've experienced. And you take that feedback and you say, yeah, I actually want to do something with it. It's only going to make you more money. Right. It could yep. have been the case for Anthem. Yeah. But but Anthem did not listen. I'm not going to beat on it too much. You know, <laughs> I know you have a soft spot for, for the game. You know, I'm going to be nice. I'm going to be nice. Right. But the critical feedback that they had for Anthem and they didn't act on that. You know, that's what we got. Right. We, we got something that sunsetted that should have still been here, right? Because it's, it's obvious that these titles, all these looter shooters can coexist. It's obvious, right? Because we have Warframe, we still have Borderlands, we still have Destiny, we still have Division, we still have uh, the Ashes one, right? Remnant of mm-hmm. the Ashes. So all these games can coexist if you listen to the individuals that are spending time with it. So I wanted to point that out first. Okay, the next thing is I have a list of some fun facts of that we should know from that conversation about what's happening with the next Metal Gear game, if you call it that or Fizzent. Okay, so some notes here. Uh, he's creating Fizzent. We are aware of that. Wanted something new to do with his own IP. He made Death Stranding. Wanted to do a franchise. Did DS2, right? Working on that. Wanted to do something new, as you mentioned. Working on OD, right? And for the last eight years, so this, is, this is his words, for the last eight years, gamers have been asking, when is the next Metal Gear game coming? The last eight years. OK, so from right. there in 2020, he fell ill. You know, he had surgery during that time, as he mentioned, wrote a will because, hey, you never know when you're going to go. Right. So whatever you're working on, whether it's the next Metal Gear game or the next book, the next podcast, the next video, the next whatever, you, we don't know where we're going to go. OK, so, you know, you're you're going to do it next year or however many years. A lot of folks that said that during a this critical point that we just had in our humanity in the last couple of years, they can't write it anymore because they're no longer here. Right. Yeah. And just just be very sensitive about that, you know, because, you know, a lot of us lost folks during that time, including myself. Right. So so in that moment, he realized that one day he wasn't going to be here anymore. Uh, Sixty years. He decided that 
hey, I'm never going to retire. I'm just going to keep doing what I love. And he decided to change his priorities because of gamer feedback to create a game that we've been asking for the last eight years. So if you can do that, if he can do that at 60, 61 Mm -hmm. this year, right? Nine more years till 70. If you could do that at that age and you are one of the greatest individuals that ever done it when it comes to, you know, world creation and 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 understanding movies. And even during the Hideo tube, when I was watching it, they had a list of all the different people that they can get that he could pretty much get anybody at this point. Yeah. You know, you know what I mean? Like whether it's in uh, the movie side or the gaming side, anyone would want to work with Hideo Kojima because of his catalog and his his creativity and his 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 genius. Right. So I think that gamers and critical feedback is essential for all the games that we're playing. What is that going to look like for uh, the next generation of games that we're going to see? You mentioned Gears earlier t- uh, today. If we see a next Gears, is it going to be the the horror thriller of the first game or is it going to be something else? Because they had to go back to that, right? Mm-hmm. Because yeah. three became more of an arcade game. Uh, four mm-hmm. was, you know, so-so. Five actually returned to that, you know, somewhat of a horror feel that we appreciated from the first game. And it seems like, as we shared earlier, every company is going back to basics. If you look at Call of Duty now, what you're playing is a game that we played years ago, reimagined with the technologies that we currently have. It's the mm-hmm. same core formula, right? And when they started doing the vertical stuff and all the other stuff that they were doing, we we're like, just go back to the formula that made you great. And look what's happening with every game, Resident Evil series. Gear series, Call of Duty series, or any any shooter, beat 'em up series, Turtles, uh, Streets of Rage. We can go down the list. Every company is going back to basics. If that, if you don't like that, mm. then I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm I'm trying to be nice today. I'm trying to be fair. I'm trying to be fair. If you don't like that, you don't like it. You don't like it. I don't know right? what to tell you. Yeah. I don't know what to tell you. But any final words on that? I, I think I think it's it's really brilliant to actually see that. Uh, and having things in place with a cooperation uh, with, you know, PlayStation, all the things that he's going to do in the future. We got OD, we got Death Stranding, we got the next Metal Gear, like a lot of excitement in the industry just on one creator and developer. Right. Imagine yeah. what's going to come, you know, this Thursday and, and all the stuff that we're going to announce. Um, we're we're going to hear announced, you know, towards the end of the year. But go ahead. You got it. Yeah, I mean, I think him coming to terms with his mortality and also listening to the fan base, you know, he came out with Death Stranding, which was a a real left curve uh, from what people expected. I think people saw that and they thought, oh, man, this is his next Metal Gear. This is the answer. And then it just ended up being something completely different. You know, he just really wanted to go a different way and create something that's never been created before. It was a game about community and about building, rebuilding the world together. You know, that's way different from uh, stealth action espionage, but yeah, the fact that he's heard the cries of the people that they want more metal gear and he's actually eating to that. That's a, that's a blow to the ego, right? Because you wanted to go somewhere new and, and do all these amazing things and establish your career and, and just keep going. Um, but the fact he has to go back to what he does best and he knows it, um, that's that's an incredible change. I, I guess my speculation here is that Konami owns the rights to Metal Gear. So is he going to try to wrestle those back? And that's why it's called Fizzent right now. That's why we don't have an official title. Is it that there might be negotiations in works where it's like, hey, you know, you want this. I want this. This is the biggest money operation either of us have ever had like this is an opportunity to make billions if we can bring metal gear back in a big way and not mess it up you know so it could be that if it's not that then it's just something that's really like metal gear with the dna and just new characters new world you know and he can pull in all the greatest actors and directors and musicians and and camera operators and everything everybody will join in to make this ultimate metal gear i don't think we've ever seen that on a video game before we have seen big games like the last of us and and we've seen what he's done with previous games with some of the best voice actors in the business and the capture that they go through to bring those experiences to life 
I don't think we've ever seen anything like what's about to happen. I don't think people understand the scale of that. It's going to be huge. Yeah, it's going to be huge. One of the things that he said, if your mother walks in on you playing this game, uh, she'll think uh, you're watching a movie. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) So, so there's, there's that. And I definitely want to go on a high note. You know, I think there's a lot of excitement in the industry. Uh, I I just want to say thank you for, for coming on. I appreciate you. Where can they find you? I'm going to have your links in the description as well. Where can they find you, Aaron? You can find me on YouTube, uh, Aaron Shack 64. Um, you can find me on Twitter at Aaron Shack 64 TV. Um, I have a podcast called the Shack cast and then a website called Aaron I'm a photographer, musician, content creator, video gamer. That's all I got for you. No, I appreciate that. Thank you for coming on. You can find me at Uriah, U-R-I-Y-Y-A. You can also find me at Andrew Alliance on YouTube. Also, Andrew Streams GG. You can find me there. And thanks for watching. Please like, subscribe, and we'll see you next time. Take care, guys.